people. My name is Catherine Hensheim with the Center for Ideas and Society at UC Riverside, and I am so happy to have the pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you so much for joining us for this final event in the series of four events in the Patriotism Project, which is co-hosted by our center and two other fantastic organizations affiliated with UC Riverside. I'm referring, of course, to the UCR Palm Desert Center and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. We're thankful to both the Osher members and the Palm Desert partners, as well as the hosting teams involved and all of the organizations for doing all that silent behind the scenes work to make sure that this event and all the events in the series come together. We're thankful to everyone who's able to join us here today as part of this uh, fourth part of an extended conversation. Um, as we get started, as always, we take a moment to acknowledge our responsibility and respect to the Kuhia, the Tongva, the Usenyo and Serrano peoples who have cared for the land, water and air in this area as members of this land grant institution here in Southern California, it's our honor and privilege to acknowledge this contribution and care and to acknowledge our responsibility to participate in that and to continue uh, the debt of respect and partnership forward into the future. Thank you to all of you for participating in that project with us. So this meeting, as you may have noted, is a little different. We are not in a Zoom meeting format. We're in a webinar format. That means the conversation continues just in a little bit of a different format. So today, as you're listening, if you have questions, please do drop them in the Q&A button. There's a little Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can hover and find that. That's a terrific place to put questions or comments that you would like to fold into the conversation. If you have general comments or you'd like to say hello, feel free to use chat just as you always do to connect with others in the meeting. So I'll be handing it off in just a moment to Dr. Warnke, the director of the Center for Ideas and Society for Introductions. Then we'll hear from our guest speaker, and then we'll open up the conversation to hear thoughts, comments, uh, and contributions from the participants as we develop this final piece of the conversation together. So without further ado, Georgia, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm going to make my introduction brief so that we have time for um, questions and discussion. Um, and uh, because Stephen Smith is quite well known, if you want to know more about him, you can look him up on the internet. Uh, Stephen Smith is the Alfred Cowles Professor of Political Science at Yale University. His research focuses on the history of political philosophy, with special attention to the problem of the ancients and moderns, the relation of religion and politics, and theories of representative government. He has received several academic awards and prizes, including the Ra Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize given by Phi Beta Kappa, the Lex Hexen Class of 63 Prize for Teaching Excellence in the Social Sciences. Um, and he is a diehard Yankees fan who hopes to be able to play for the team in his next life. However, since he's not yet in his next life, his accomplishments include a series of well-known publications, including Hegel's Critique of Liberalism from 1989, Spinoza Liberalism and Jewish Identity, 1997, Spinoza's Book of Life, 2003, Reading Leo Strauss from 2006, The Cambridge Companion to Leo Strauss from 2009, Political Philosophy, 2012, Modernity and Its Disconsents, 2016, and his new book, which we'll be discussing today, Reclaiming Patriotism in an Age of Extremes. So Professor Smith, thank you so much for coming and I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Georgia. We call each other by our first names. She did not mention we were old friends who went back to our days at Yale when we were both youngsters, considerably younger than we are now. But it's wonderful to reconnect and it's an honor to be here as a guest uh, at the UCR here in Riverside. I'm gonna keep my comments fairly short, about 15 minutes, because I hope, or because I expect, or I hope people will have lots of questions and comments. Uh, I should tell you in advance, I can take any amount of criticism, so long as it's nothing short of unadulterated praise. So uh, with that, uh, let me just say, don't expect my comments to be completely uh, coherent. I'm going to just talk 
from a few different ideas that emerge in the book, uh, just as a way of sort of generating some, some thoughts and discussion, although I don't know how much we need of that. But anyway, let me go on. On the evening that Joe Biden claimed his presidential victory over Donald Trump, he reprised a trope that Barack Obama had made famous at the Democratic National Convention in 2004. There are no red states, no blue states, Biden told an adoring audience, just the United States. The idea that we are all one people, going back to the Constitution's promise of a more to form a more perfect union, has always been more of an aspiration than a reality. In a country increasingly divided by geography, ethnicity, education, culture, even our understanding of facts, what is the source of national unity? The idea that we share a common history held together by a collective memory is at the source of the disposition that I call patriotism. Patriotism is an old, even an ancient term. The word goes back to the Greek patris, or place of one's ancestors, and the Latin patria, or fatherland. Broadly associated with love of country, the idea of patriotism naturally raises many questions. Like every form of love, patriotism is partly determined by the object of its affection. To love our country, Edmund Burke wrote in his Reflections on the Revolution in France, to love our country, our country must be lovely. But what if it isn't? Then what do we do? There's also a question of what makes love of country an admirable sentiment. In his funeral oration, Pericles exhorted his fellow Athenians to feed your eyes upon the city until love of her fills your hearts. Does love of country as a form of erotic attachment force us to ignore the flaws of our beloved? Do we become like Pygmalion who fell in love with his own creation? Hannah Arendt once wondered whether it was even possible to love an abstraction like a country composed of millions of people one can never know. Isn't love something we can only express toward individuals? I wanna to return to that question a bit later. Patriotism has always been a contested virtue because it must contend with other loyalties to family, friends, tribe, and religion. As any reader of Sophocles' Antigone would immediately recognize the conflict between love of family and love of country is as old as Western literature. In the case of virtually inevitable conflict of loyalties, it is not clear which side has priority. Modern patriotism has to contend with two alternatives that vie for predominance. These are nationalism and cosmopolitanism. We might consider patriotism on an Aristotelian continuum as a mean between the extremes of excess and deficiency. I want to consider patriot nationalism and cosmopolitanism as the two extremes from which we must begin to disentangle patriotism. On the political right, patriotism must be distinguished from nationalism, at least I want to. Nationalism and patriotism initially grow out of a leg legitimate desire for self-determination, but over time, nationalism morphs into an ideology of grievance and resentment. It has become a weapon for determining who is in and who is out, who is a real American and who is not. Nationalist stories are typically narratives of treason and betrayal by unscrupulous elites in which listeners or readers are encouraged to feel contempt for fellow citizens who fall outside the dominant ethnic group. Nationalists seek the warmth of community, but always at the expense of an outgroup who is deemed un-American, traitorous, or to use a lang term that we've heard more recently, enemies of the people. On the left, however, the critique of patriotism is undertaken by a kind of cosmopolitan multiculturalism. Multiculturalism was originally an academic theory that sought to give voice to previously underrepresented minorities, women, African-Americans, gays, and so on. But over time has morphed into a kind of race for victim status. The 1619 project promoted by the New York Times dates the American founding from the time when 20 African slaves were sold to the Jamestown colony in Virginia. On this account, 
American history, even the American Revolution itself is presented as based upon persistent racial oppression and hierarchy. One reason I cannot accept this view is that it denies the efforts of generations of Americans, black and white, in their struggle to achieve a more perfect union. Slavery may be an irreparable stain on America, but it is not the essence of America. <clears throat> so where does patriotism differ? Patriotism is above all a form of loyalty. We admire loyalty to family, friends, sports teams, even institutions up to a point. Yet loyalty also sits uneasily with other qualities that we equally admire, qualities like fairness, justice, mercy, equality, and open-mindedness. These do not always sit together, sit easily together. There seems to be something primitive, almost primordial about loyalty, almost like it was a kind of mafia code of omerta. But loyalty, as I argue in my book, is the first virtue of social institutions. Without it, our collective life could not last a single day. Loyalty is an affirmation of what we care about. Our cares are not momentary whims or desires, but more like a structure of loyalties. What we care about defines the kinds of persons we are or wish to be. Loyalty is a virtue of character, as when someone says, I've got your back, or when we describe someone as a stand-up guy. It means that is someone we can count on. Whether loyalty is hardwired into our biological makeup, as some social psychologists have argued, whether it is a litmus test for distinguishing conservatives who ostensibly value loyalty to particular groups from liberals who ostensibly value more universalist causes is not really important for my purposes. Loyalty is inseparable, I believe, from our nature as political animals and we cannot function well without it. Patriotism, however, is a form of constitutional loyalty. It is not simply loyalty to a people, but loyalty to a particular constitutional order what we call a liberal democracy or a constitutional democracy. Our pledge of allegiance, for example, is an oath to the flag and the republic for which it stands. Our patriotism is uniquely constitutional in form. A change of constitution, rather than just a change of administrations, would require a change of loyalty. A fascist or a communist America would no longer be the regime established by the constitution and would therefore no longer serve as the basis of citizen loyalty. It might be the same country, but it would be a different America. American patriotism is uniquely a patriotism of ideas. We are and have been from our beginnings, a people of the book, or maybe I should say of books. The Puritans thought of themselves as creating a city on the hill, a kind of New Jerusalem in the wilderness of New England. The constitutional framers, authors of the first written constitution, created a text that would stand the test of time. From our beginnings, ours has been a patriot, patriotism rooted in ideas, and no idea uh, is more important than the idea of equality given voice in the Declaration of Independence. And no one has put greater emphasis upon this concept than our greatest patriot, Abraham Lincoln. I will just, I will not give much away when I say that Lincoln turns out to be the hero uh, of my book. But loyalty to constitutional order is not only a matter of the head, but of the heart. It is not simply a matter of logos, but of ethos. It requires an understanding of the principles of modern Republican government, but it is also what Tocqueville called a habit of the heart. An ethos is not just a manner of thinking, but of feeling. This suggests that patriotism is something ingrained in our moral sentiments and dispositions. Tocqueville's appeal to the heart was clearly drawing on the work of an earlier French philosopher, Blaise Pascal, who believed that knowing is a matter of both reason and faith. The heart has its reasons that reason does not know. Pascal wrote, 
in one of his pensées. The ethos of a society embodies those traits of char character that are looked up to as normative by the community. Those human beings who best embody the admired traits and characteristics are those deemed best worthy to occupy positions of public trust. The ethos describes the character or tone of a regime, what it finds most worthy of admiration, what it looks up to. This is not to say that any community will be composed of identical human types, but they will possess distinct features that form their national character. The idea of an ethos patriotism, however, runs into an evident difficulty. Doesn't loyalty to one country or one way of life stand in contradiction with the principles of equality and moral inclusiveness that are equally part of the, Amer of the American ethos? How can I regard all persons as equal if my loyalties are to my country alone? Where is the line drawn between what we owe to fellow citizens and what we owe to fellow human beings who may be experiencing pain and suffering? Some version of this question is at the core of our current debates about border security and immigration. Are we at bottom a nation of immigrants who welcome the stranger, the huddled masses yearning to be breathe free in Emma Lazarus's phrase, or do we require a border wall as a way of protecting our national sovereignty? How broadly or narrowly do we define ourselves? In defining ourselves too broadly, we risk losing our ethos. In defining ourselves too narrowly, we risk losing our humanity. The fear is that ethos patriotism leads to an insular vision of a fortress America, an embattled island in a sea of moral and political chaos. This is not a wholly irrational fear. Nevertheless, loyalty to country does not require me to be indifferent, much less hostile to the needs of others. Loyalty to country is something closer to family loyalty. This does not regard me to think my family is better than all others. I may love my family best, but this does not require me to despise others. It does re require me, however, to give some moral preference to my family. My preference, for example, for my child, my wish to see him get into a good school, have a satisfying career, to prosper and succeed, is not some immoral desire to see him win at all costs, much less a wish that others around him should fail. I would rather be failing in my duty as a parent if I did not equally attempt to instill some conception of justice and fair play. So what is true about loyalty to family is true about loyalty to larger units like states. Partiality for my own country need not lead to indifference or hostility to others. Except for times of war, rarely do we find ourselves locked in a zero sum game where what's good for one is bad for the other. There is nothing shameful in attending to, the, to our own interests first, namely the interests of American workers and farmers. We look after others better when we first learn to look after ourselves. This is not a recipe for isolationism or economic protectionism, but a recognition that the well being of our country, just like our neighborhood, is dependent on the well being of the people around us. In Hillel's famous dictum, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? This is not simply a statement of individual responsibility, but rather of social obligations that put fellow citizens at the top of our list of priorities. Another fear is that patriotism leads us to ignore past and present injustices, resulting in a kind of blind faith. This is also a legitimate concern, but it is not necessarily the case. Patriotism, as I understand it, can be critical and self-correcting. Consider only the case of Congressional Medal of Honor winners who had previously been overlooked due to their race. What is this but an expression of regret for our previous failures and a desire to enlarge who was considered part of the American family? Patriotism is not then the same thing as simply my country right or wrong. It is a desire to see one's country live up to its highest promises. This was the idea behind Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail in which King appealed to the country to live up to its founding principles. Like Lincoln before him, he appealed to the Declaration of Independence as America's mission statement 
and his constant poll stock. Even while protesting Southern segregation statutes, he did not lose faith in America and its progressive aspirations, an example from which many of today's activists could take a lesson. King's act of simple and dignified resistance shows that patriotism can be combined with self-criticism. His protests appeal to what was best, not what was worst in our traditions. Critique is best exercised when it grows not out of detachment and resentment, but out of care and love. Like much else in our public lives, patriotism has become deeply politicized. It would be easy, as we witness the rise of ethno-nationalism in various parts of the world, to reject patriotism as tainted with xenophobia, racism, and other forms of ethnic and religious bigotry. But again, things are not this simple. These are not expressions of patriotism, but perversions of it. If patriotism misused can be harsh and punitive, at its best, it can be elevating and ennobling. When rightly expressed, patriotism supports the virtues of civility, respect for law, tolerance, honor, responsibility, courage, and sacrifice, all virtues worth having and cultivating. Like every form of virtue, patriotism must be taught. The only question is, who will be its teachers? Will it be harsh and punitive or humane and enlightened? because I believe there is no third alternative. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So um, I'd like to open it up for uh, questions. I think that um, I can, either you can um, have me read the questions or I have a little button that says allowed to talk. So our first question is from David Glidden. David, do you want to talk? Should I allow you to talk? Hello? Yes. Oh, okay. here I am. Can you see me? Yeah. Hi, Steve. It's, it's wonderful to see you in person. I've been corresponding and no doubt gotten to be a nuisance uh, reading your book, but I enjoyed it so much. Uh, one of the things I loved about your book was your interest in Lincoln and your discussion of how crucial he is in creating a, a post-Civil War a loyalty uh, and patriotism. But some of the things he said in his career had to do with self-reliance and the importance of uh, people uh, fulfilling their destiny through their own labor. And I wonder how that would have worked with uh, the end of the Civil War, when uh, uh, slaves were not literate, owned no property, were impoverished, how might equality become meaningful for them? Wouldn't it have required uh, uh, a kind of search for equity, uh, helping people who have been oppressed uh, find their family members and intervening to help them be educated and prosperous? Would Lincoln have been interested in that? Thanks, David. And uh, I wish I could see you. I think you can do your video button, but anyway. But thank you for that question. We, we have been sharing a lively back and forth on a range of questions and issues. And um, yeah, I'm glad you, you liked the Lincoln part. Uh, that's a good question. That's a tough question. Uh, Lincoln was Lincoln was an advocate of free labor and self-reliance. He thought that was that was a crucial part of his life and his life experience. Um, and his speech speeches are full of the language of lifting weights from people's shoulders, making it possible for them to participate fairly in what he sometimes called or described as the race of life. So there is a sense that, uh, I mean, at least the first order of business for Lincoln was just to put an end to slavery, to lift the weights from people's shoulders and lift the weights to, to allow them to work freely and, and gain, you know, the uh, fruit, to earn, earn the fruits of their labor and their, their livelihoods. That for him was the first step. So, and, and maybe the all important step. The question that you raise, which I think is a 
completely legitimate one for Lincoln is would he have, to what degree would he have endorsed sort of positive efforts beyond just lifting weights to compensate for uh, in terms of education and in terms of particularly education in, in helping enslaved peoples find a, a footing of, of equality. Uh, unfortunately, it was not a question that Lincoln lived to engage in a, in a deep, I think, and in, in meaningful way. I'm inclined to believe uh, he, he would have done that he would have seen the wisdom of that, given the, the general importance he, he attributes to education. Uh, and I think he understands that education can be self-education, but it's also education is also a collective effort as well. And uh, I think, you know, who knows, but I, I, Lincoln did not, you know, did not have the opportunity to, I think, develop his, his thoughts along the, those lines. But I think once again, given the, the importance of education for citizenship, that fits nicely with, with what I described as in many ways, the progressivist side of Lincolnian patriotism. Thanks very much. Other questions, comments? I have a question. So, oh wait, there's somebody has a question. Somebody's raising their hand. I don't understand that well. Um, if you have a question, um, please put it in the question and answer box and uh, I can either ask it for you or I can uh, allow you to talk. Um, so my question, Oh, Steve Brent has a question. Steve, where are you? Oh, you're down here. Wait, where is he? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I'm going to allow you to talk, Steve. There you go. You're on. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Steve and I, what I've read of your book so far, I'm finding to be just a, a wonderful clearing of the underbrush and uh, an inspiring sort of re- reimagining of uh, patriotism for our age. So uh, kudos. My question is um, just about the kind of um, op- Oh, sorry. I screwed up. Oop. Sorry, Steve. now you can talk, sorry. Okay. Okay. Did you, I don't know whether you heard my preamble, but if, if not, uh, I'll just get to the question. Right, we heard. Uh, uh, the question is about the distinctions you draw on the right and left, um, looking at nationalism on the right as um, a kind of distorted form of patriotis patriotism and cosmopolitanism on the left as, a, as something that's opposed to patriotism as, as you see it. And I'm just wondering whether um, you're missing something on the left, which is, which you talk about, but um, you know, don't um, identify, which is uh, kind of subnational identifications that are connected often to uh, the diaspora community. It is a kind of cosmopolitanism, I suppose, but it's, it seems um, different to me from cosmopolitanism and in some ways quite parallel to um, another kind of ethno-nationalism or sub-national identity on the right, a kind of white ethno-nationalism. And just as the right needs to see the kind of flaws in the American experience, it may be the case that the left needs to see some of the virtues of uh, the American experience. And there may be a, a kind of uh, mirror-like, uh, you know, mirror-like parallelism uh, there as well. So what do you think? No, uh, Steve, I think that's a great observation. And uh, I mean, and I do speak at times in the book talking about how white nationalism is really sort of the multiculturalism of the right. Uh, you know, I think, I think the white nationalists uh, learned something 
from the left, which is to say, uh, if the left can have its multicultural identity politics, why can't the right? And what happened was the emergence of the kind of white, white identity politics, white nationalist politics, was, which was a mirror image. You, you put it, I think, quite well when you called it kind of sub-political in a way, but taking these, these, these sub-political units of race, ethnicity, and then turning them into into the sort of the ultimate identity groups. You see this as a, a common strategy of both the left and, and, and the right. And I think neither, um, you know, both, both represent significant challenges to, you know, the idea of, of, of a kind of national identity that patriotism or net constitutional loyalty that patriotism uh, demands as, as, I, as I see it. But I think you're 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 very correct in, in making that observation. So following on that, I have a question. Um, if if patriotism is to avoid both the um, the kind of uber nationalism of the right and the um, the kind of uh, disgust with America by what Rorty calls the cultural left. Um, in your view, which, and if we are to get to some kind of um, kind of notion of patriotism that you advance, where is the biggest obstacle or where is the biggest challenge on the right or the left? Well, they each present challenges of a different kind. And, um, and, and they represent them for, for different constituencies. Uh, in the world that you and I inhabit, which is to say the world of universities and people with higher degrees and so on, the, the intellectual elite, you might say, of the country, uh, there's very much an identification with cosmopolitanism. Uh, we, you know, we go to conferences worldwide. We ideas transfer across borders uh, e easily. Uh, trade and ideas are the two things that, that kind of unite the economic and the intellectual elites. And there comes to be a kind of disparagement of patriotism from from these from these two these two sides of the elite. I must say, one of the secret pleasures I had in writing this book, now, now that it's finished, I can no longer quite have the same pleasure, is being able to tell colleagues and people on a university campus, oh, I'm writing a book on patriotism and why it's a good thing. And looking at the expressions of sometime quizzical or sometimes bemusement, but often shock and horror as if I'd just confess to some, you know, god awful sin or confess to being an ax murderer or something. Uh, but no, I think there is genuine concern that the intellectual and I would say economic elites both have sort of lost touch with, with what is central to the country. That's something Trump played into, and working people understood that, that the economic elites and the things that kind of Richard Rorty complained about, I think very presciently in his book of 20 years ago, saw that was going on that you know would really lead to the uh, disaffection of the American working classes from the elites. But the other side of that that you point out is that we're, we, we, we I mean, that by that kind of you and I probably don't see to the same degree is the truly powerful effect that nationalism, white identity politics, this kind of thing has in, in for, 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 many, for many Americans, particularly those who feel dispossessed and, uh, and sort of despi and despised. And, you know, there've been a number of very good books, interesting books written. I think of J.D. Vance's book, Hillbilly Elegy, and uh, Arlie Hochschild's book. Um, just blanking on the name of it at the moment, but there've been Strangers a number. Strangers in their own land, is that it? What's, what's that? Strangers in their own land. Yes, yeah, straight, exactly, yeah. Which really does sort of uh, point point out the, uh, the, 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 the 
fertile ground and the reasons for why these kinds of nationalist appeals uh, have become so potent and, and real in, 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 re in recent times. And I think uh, one, of the one of the reasons that I wrote the book, or you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not evident, maybe it is, I'm not really sure, is to me, it was written as a way of saying, at least to people on the center left, and that we call the moderate left of some kind, uh, not to run away from the language of patriotism. The language of patriotism has become foreign uh, and to some degree alien to liberals and people on the left. And I think it's very important for the, le the left, when I say the left, I'm really talking about kind of the center and moderate left, to re-engage and re-endorse that language because Americans are a very patriotic people. And if the left decides to abandon that language, uh, I think in the long term, even in the short term, they're going to lose. And I think we need those of us who want to avoid particularly the disaster of the last four years and more and what could be again, uh, need to find a way of embracing patriotism. I think, I think this is kind of moving beyond your question, Georgia. I think Biden is making some efforts in that direction. Uh, he's always been good at kind of engaging the, the working class, the blue collar Americans. I wish he would do that with using a little more of the language of the kind of language of patriotism that I think he's capable, but somehow I really haven't heard much directly in his in his language in his speeches. I'll kind of leave it at that. Yeah, I think um, you know, our so we've had uh, this is our fourth session on patriotism leading up to your book, and and um, we had one on indigeneity and patriotism, and one on protest, Black Lives Matter, and patriotism, and um, both you know both. Uh, certainly Native Americans, according to pro a professor here at, at University of California, Riverside, are very patriotic, right? Uh, they start their um, powwows with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And um, I think it's, it's, it's true that, that on the one hand, you have a kind of um, cultural left, which is always pointing out America's sins, particularly with uh, marginalized people and people of color, where those people are much more patriotic than the cultural left. So it, that, that strikes me as very, very is spot on. I mean, I'm not a sociologist. I haven't done kind of empirical work on this, but my, my just kind of un totally unscientific observation is that minority communities are often far more patriotic than often white elites assume they are or attribute to, to them. And I think that's really an, an, an important source of our uh, minority communities are, are really an important source of, of American patriotism, who uh, you, that is very, I think, very inspiring to me. And um, I, I think the, I'm sorry, the phone is ringing back here. So we have uh, three questions. I think Kevin Pham has a question. Kevin, I'm going to allow you to talk. Are you there? Yes, hi, hi. Um, uh, hi, Professor Smith, uh, I really enjoyed your book. Um, uh, I, I particularly enjoyed your kind of takedown of George Katev and Martha Nussbaum, uh, um, and and um, you know you you wrote that uh, Katev um, uh, takes a distorted or one-sided conception of patriotism for the whole. He writes that quote a good patriot is a good killer end quote without ever asking for whom or for what purpose a person might kill. And um, I, I was just thinking about 
my own research, I, I write about Vietnam, Vietnamese patriotism in the 1920s. And the key task for the Vietnamese during the French colonial period was to uh, create patriotism. And it was for the purpose of unifying the people to free themselves from uh, humiliating colonial rule. And, and I kind of thought like, well, maybe when the powerful use patriotism to oppress the weak, that's bad. But when the weak colonize use patriotism to fight the powerful, you know, that's something that leftists would, would like, you know. Um, so that's just a thought I, I had. Um, but um, the question I had was, you, you, you explain what patriotism is, what enlightened patriotism is, but can you speak more directly to why should we have in this country, patriotism. Why? Uh, thanks for that. Thanks for that question, Kevin. I'm very interested to hear you're looking at Vietnamese patriotism in the, in the, in the 20s. That would be a really interesting topic. Sounds like a very interesting topic. Just to go back to the, your first comment, I should say, I, I especially enjoyed writing those pages about George K. Tibb and Martha Nussbaum. Uh, I should say by um, this for purposes of truth and advertising, I, I actually re regard George as a very good, as a good friend and a good conversation partner. Uh, I've known him for a long time and, and he and I have in, engaged several times and I would say spirited disagreement, but always in a good spirit. And he, he's a very good person, you know, I, uh, he's in, he has an extreme view, I think, but uh, it's, it's expressed honestly and uh, I enjoy his, uh, I do enjoy his point of view, you know, challenging and, and sparring with his point of view a great deal. I can't say quite the same for Martha Nussbaum. But your question, um, why should we, uh, why should people remain patriotic, you know, which I think is, is a good one and it's, a, it's a, sort of a hard, in a way it's a hard question to answer. Uh, I can fall back on sort of general arguments of the kind that I used just a minute ago when I said, well, Americans are a patriotic people. And if people from the, uh, you know, from the liberal side want to, you know, you know, succeed in politically, you know, they have to learn how to become more comfortable again with, with, the, with the language of patriotism. But that, isn't exactly an answer, I, I, th I think, to your question. Uh, I could also fall back, as I occasionally do in the book, I actually believe this to be true, uh, with, with the Aristotelian claim that, that we are political animals by nature. And as political animals, patriotism is a part of what it means to be a political animal. Uh, Aristotle doesn't include patriotism as such in his list of the virtues, but he talks about civic friendship and he talks about the importance of this kind of friendship for a flourishing uh, community. And I think that's something not so far removed from patriotism. But even that may not be a very good, terribly good answer to your question. Finally, I would just want to say, I think that patriotism, as I, as I sort of said near the end, um, can be an ennobling virtue. Uh, we, we have, I think, a, we are as, as human beings, we have, a dis, we have a wish to belong. We have a need, a need in a way to belong. And belongingness brings with it, you know, certain qualities, qualities like I talked about civility, uh, respect for law, tolerance, but also honor, um, sacrifice, self-sacrifice. These are all virtues. And I think patriotism encourages, hey, patriotism at its best can, can, can encourage these things. So I do think of patriotism without wanting to go too far afield is, is really an important aspect for a politically flourishing community and for a, a flourishing way of life. We have an anonymous question. Um, where do our symbols fit into helping or hurting patriotism? The flag, our service people defending our rights, others? Let's see, I'm not, could you, I'm sorry, I'm not quite, where do the symbols of the flag, say that again? Do they help or hurt patriotism? 
like the flag, right? So often when I see the flag, I think I sort of clench because I think, oh dear, this is this is uber nationalism, right? But really it's the flag. Yeah, uh, that's a great, that's also a great question. Let me, let me, let me answer it by a story that I use in the book, actually, uh, near the beginning of the book, which uh, I think captures some of the ambivalence about this. Uh, and the story was this, we were, this was now a couple of years ago, we were at a 4th of July party at some friend's house, a colleague from Yale, some other number of other people were there. And the hostess, as we were sitting outside of the, the cookout, uh, as we were sitting outside, the hostess of the party said, do we feel patriot? She asked, do we feel patriotic? And I could tell there was a distinct sense of uncomfortableness when that question was posed, do we feel unpatriotic? And then she went on to ask, how many of you uh, grew up in homes that flew a flag. She then she said she did. Uh, nobody else had. No, nobody else did. And it was a, it was an it was to me it was a revealing, even though slightly uncomfortable moment. We then went on to read the Declaration of Independence before we dug into our hamburgers and hot dogs on that Fourth of July. But it was a story that stuck with me. Because I, I do think the flag for many people, for many people, it is just absolutely unproblematical. And for others, it does raise questions of kind of what, what you know, what, what, is, what is this person saying and, and wearing a flag lapel or flying a flag or something like that. Um, I don't think the flag, I, once again, I, I'm gonna say the same thing about that as I said a bit earlier about patriotism. I, I think, I think, People on the left need, I mean, think, thinking of the old camp game, you know, capture the flag. Uh, I think the left needs to recapture the flag. Uh, I really do. I mean, I don't think it's something we should run away, we should run away from. Uh, it, it's important, it's, symbols are, we can say symbols don't really mean, but symbols are important. Uh, I think for a way of life, and you know, anthropologists talk about this. I think they know. In this respect, I think they know what they're talking about. The way symbols uh, are are so important, and we, we shouldn't run away from the flag because if we do, it will be adopted entirely for the wrong purposes elsewhere. So, uh, I, I'm I'm one who believes that these symbols count. It's it's part of what I call ethos patriotism. It's, it speaks not so much to the head. The, the flag doesn't speak so much to the head, but to the to the heart. And I think we we need to have a richer richer sense of of these symbols that constitute uh, the American Republic. So David Glidden is up again. I'm going to allow him to talk. There he is. David, Thanks, are you I just. Uh, here I am, if you can hear me. Uh, uh, I, 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 this is a, a, a question that's been in my mind a lot. It seems to me that all citizens who vote are patriots. Mm -hmm. But in the last election, we learned that we're not patriots of the same country. And I think that's a problem. Taking back to the 60s and 70s, I've demonstrated vehemently and often for civil rights and against the war in Vietnam. And I did so because I loved my country. Mm -hmm. I thought it needed to allow blacks the rights that they're entitled to, and it should never have gone to the war in Vietnam. Other people thought that by doing so, I was betraying the country. And so there's this problem of Yes, people on the left are patriotic, but the country we're patriotic to is rather different from the country people on the right are patriotic to. There was this line uh, Ronald Reagan gave, which got me so irritated. He said, the left is so far left, they've left America. And in doing so, he suggested that if you didn't agree with the Republican party, you were a traitor. Mm. 
And I think that logic suggests, like the last election, that we're divided into two groups of patriots who have two very different ideas of what America is. And I don't see how we can reconcile those ideas into one. Well, that's good. I, and nor can we. I mean, one of the arguments I make, we've always been a, you know, we can't, we're not going to eliminate conflict and contention and disagreement from politics. That's simply what politics is. It's man, man finding a way to manage our, our disagreements and conflicts <clears throat> with, with one another. Uh, you know, Reagan, you know, I, I don't, back then, I mean, today I'm thinking there's a certain element of truth in what he said uh, about, <clears throat> about the left. I, I think there's a certain amount that you know, it applies equally to the far right as well. They've so far right, they've, they've kind of left, left America as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that because of these extremes, we, we can find just some kind of consensualist middle ground where there will be consensus. We will always have we will always have policy disputes and disagreements on, on all kinds on all kinds of things. Uh, but that doesn't mean uh, we cannot we we cannot uh, we cannot claim for ourselves a certain a certain kind of, of, of patriotism of this of what I would call this I don't know I call it enlightened patriotism in the book. Uh, but a, a kind of centrist, cent more centrist patriotism that can extend from what I would think of as in many ways the center, the center right to, to the center left. Um, I think both sides are looking, uh, people on the center left, right, I think are legitimately concerned with the direction of the Republican Party and its movement in the directions of a cult of personality and ethno-nationalism and so on. I think people on the center left are genuinely concerned with some of the protest movements, cancel culture and, and other things that seem to dominate uh, kind of the far, far left of, of their party, the kind of thing maybe that Reagan was talking about in a certain way and was Things are diff very different now than they were. Hard to believe 40 years ago when he, he became president. But um, you know, this is this is kind of a patriotism that, it, 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 my view at least, you know, is one that I, I think is capable of speaking to to both the, the moderates of both of both political parties, while not denying for a moment that you know, of course, policy and political debate will, will, will continue as it, as it always has. But the point is that- If I could just- No, no please, go, on, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 let's focus simply on those who vote. Yeah. Uh, those who vote. It seems to me, if you are a voter, you're a patriot. You're following your rights and duties as a citizen. And yet we have in recent weeks, a large effort on the right to prevent people on the left from voting. Mm -hmm. uh, preventing people from voting seems an act of treachery, mm -hmm. of a not patriotism. But what's at issue, I think, in Arizona and other states is the desire of people on the right to say, only we are patriots. Mm -hmm. The other citizens really aren't citizens. They shouldn't vote. And I think that's, the problem that bothers me, uh, when can we get to the point where we respect those who vote and their opinions without trying to stop the other side from voting? That's that's what bothers me. Well, I- I, we, but I wanna get one more question in here, which is kind of related by uh, Lawrence Feynman. Do you wanna talk? I'm going to allow you to, which is about conflict. So I think it might belong here. Good. Lawrence? Hi. Hi, Professor. Thank you very much. My pleasure. The, uh, the question that I had was just the general philosophical qu question of the concept of patriotism. And um, 
comparing it to uh, religious beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, in your judgment, would you feel that uh, patriotism in the course of history, like religion, has probably been responsible for more war and uh, discord between states than um, most, if any, other factors? And if so, uh, should we be promoting patriotism as a, as a belief system, or should we be attempting to relegate it as a, uh, something that should be pushed uh, to the past and uh, not promoted any further? No, great thought. Um, I would begin with questioning the premise of the, of the question a bit, whether religion or patriotism is, are, are themselves responsible for the wars and the conflicts of you know, human history. Um, it's only taking, I mean, even be hard to prove that, but even if you could, it would just simply be, these are also responsible for, for many, many, if not most of the goods as well of political societies and, and civilization. So, you know, I don't, I don't think we can just isolate these as causes of, of, of the things we, we dislike. I, I would push back against that, uh, that sort of assumption. Um, no, I think, and now I've kind of, I'm afraid, it, Lawrence, can I ask you, I, I, in answering that, I, I've sort of lost the, I, I got focused on, 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 on thinking about that, uh, that point, could you, could you rephrase just what was the what was the question again? I kind of lost it. Georgia, can you unmute him? Yeah, I have it written here. In the scope of yeah. world history, would you agree that patriotism, like religion, has been the cause of more war and conflict than most any other belief? If so, should it be promoted as a virtue or pushed aside to a lesser status? Well, I don't think we can simply, it's not that easy to simply push this aside. Uh, I, I don't think we can. Uh, we, we live in states, we live in political communities and that are organized as states. That's the, that's the way in which for the last 300 years or so, the business of politics has conducted itself since the Treaty of Westphalia, you know, it's a long story, but you know, here we are, here we are today. It's had many hiccups along the way, but here we are for better or worse. I don't think we can just say, you know, maybe in an idea, maybe in some kind of ideal world, which I, which is the kind of political theorizing I, I don't like to engage in, you know, in a world of perfect justice in a world of perfect equality, you know, maybe we wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't need patriotism. Maybe we wouldn't, we wouldn't need religion. These things could just be pushed aside. Maybe that would even be. Maybe they would even be better worlds than the world we we live in. But I keep asking myself: We don't live in that world. This this is the world we this is the world we have, and we have to try to make sense of it and and respond to it in the best way we can. And as I said at the end of the paper, it seems to me the question before us is not whether we're going to have patriotism or whether we're not. The question is, what kind of patriotism will we have? Will it be, will it be harsh and 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 cruel, and exclusionary, or will it be humane and enlightened? I think those, to me, are the the, the options in front of us, and we can't really imagine. Well, we can imagine, I suppose, but we can't really expect any any third option. And that's what I'm. My book was written to to defend a kind of view of patriotism that I think. We, we should be able to live with and, and defend. So I, I'm, I'm for it, I'm for it. That's why I wrote the book, by the way. Well, thank you so much. We've come to the top of the hour and I want to um, uh, appreciate David's question because it sort of gets back to the, uh, to the impetus for this project or one of the impetuses, which was attacks on the Capitol on grounds on the grounds that the election was stolen. And so the question was what and, and those people calling themselves patriots. Um, 
And so that sort of left us with the question, well, what is patriotism? And so we're very grateful for you, to you, for uh, coming to talk to us about this. Uh, Catherine, do you wanna send us out? I think you did a lovely job. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Thank you all for joining us for this extended conversation, for this experiment in the making where we develop these ideas over a period of four weeks together. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at future events and thank you so much to you all for being with us. Thank you.